Hello and welcome to episode 93 of Beyond the Brick. I'm Joshua Hanlon. And I'm Matthew Kev. And this episode of Beyond the Brick is brought to you by Brickmania.com. And our featured product from Brickmania this week is the German Panzer IV medium tank. And this is actually a remake of a kit originally released in 2009 by Daniel Siskin. And that's one of the great things about Brickmania that I really like is they continue to redesign their kits and make them better and better as new Lego parts come out and as they get new tracks and that kind of thing. So they're always continuing to bring you a better product and the best product possible. So you might remember seeing this tank before in places, but this is a redesign to make it even better this time. And the tank includes a custom printed Panzer Commander minifig and the turret has a full 360 degree rotation and three opening crew hatches. So this is a really, really neat kit that I really liked, so I thought I'd share it with you, and definitely encourage you to check that out on their website, brickmania.com, and I'll make sure to link to that in the description as well. And now our guest this week is Anu Pearson. Uh, she is on Flickr, Mock Pages, and Brick Shelf, so uh, there are still some people left on Brick Shelf for those of you who would like to look at photos on there. And she is 43 years old, an accountant and a small business owner, and a member of C-Lug, uh, PSLTC, and ArchLug. And I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute here what some of those are, if you aren't familiar with some of those acronyms. Uh, so it's great to have you on the show, Anu. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. No problem. So like I mentioned, you do post, I think you post pretty much all your photos on Brickshelf as well as Mock Pages and Flickr. So what keeps you going there on Brickshelf? Is there something you like about that that you continue to post there? Uh, it's just old habit. It was the first hosting, picture hosting website. Uh, when I started, I put my first marks there. So it's just kind of a tradition or a superstition or I don't know <laughs> what you want to call it, but uh, I just keep that going. It's one of the last sites I'll go to when I'm posting. I'll start in Flickr, go to mark pages, but then I always go back there. <laughs> You got it, kind of got your set priorities there, but but you always make it back to brick shelf in the end. I do, I do. <laughs> I I don't want to give up on it, and uh, um, I forget the name of the owner, but I met him recently at BrickCon, and he's a really nice. Kevin Locke. Right? Yeah. Okay. Kevin Locke. So, yeah. yeah. He was at BrickCon. I met him, and a really nice guy. So I just keep going with brick shelf. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's like uh, he's a, he's a very very nice guy, and it was kind of bizarre. The first, I met him at Brick Fair once, and it, just to put like a, a name and like a person to a website that I always thought like was like existed like you know and like it was like some kind of secret organization, and it's it just a guy. And yeah. He created it. Yeah. So why not dignify him? Put put yourself on his site. So. Yeah. Good job. And uh, yeah, ne really nice guy. Uh, AFOL, a collector, his wife collects, and uh, really nice people, so one of us. <laughs> awesome. So are there any hidden builders on there that don't post anywhere else that you follow? Any, anything that people should check out that, they aren't, that they're missing on Flickr mock pages? Uh, I'm not sure. I think there are some European builders that are there. I wouldn't. I didn't make a note of them, but I just go through it once in a while, and uh, I find really cool builds there. I think uh, Brothers Brick posted something yesterday. It was a really nice ship from Brickshelf. Uh, I think. Okay. Yeah, I remember that. I I remember seeing those photos. So yeah. it is important. I always check Brickshelf every once in a while because you do see stuff that like kind of isn't you know. Like so everywhere, it's not like because it's it's not Flickr, it's not like you know something that everybody uses. So there always are like those quirky builders that kind of only put their stuff there. So yeah, so, and yeah. so there may be people who don't want uh, feedback, you know. So yeah, exactly. Just yeah, put their pictures up, and that's where it is. Yep, they just want someone to see it. They don't want to hear about it or just any. Just want to yeah. put it out there. Mm. So there is some some purpose to it still out there for builders who are posting their stuff there. And there's really cool stuff from old times, like before uh, in the 2000, early 2000s, since that was only a hosting site. There's some really nice builds there. Oh, definitely. Yeah, you can like, and also photos of like old fan events. I know I've uh, spent some time looking at like photos of like the first Brick Fest and, you know, lots of early AFOL interactions and like early yeah. AFOL conventions. So. 
Yeah. It's like a little, little capsule of history, of uh, Lego history in there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, but not about the... brick shelf, <laughs> right? <laughs> Do One more thing about brick shelf, I just came to mind. I think it'd be cool if somebody did like a, a hidden treasures of brick shelf. You know, like like you're saying, old conventions and yeah, cool old builds that uh, people just getting in the community might not know about. So that that's something to keep in mind for the future that we might have to do. <laughs> Stories yeah. of brick shelf past. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We should. Somebody should do that because, like, five years down the road, uh, people will have not. I mean, you know about brick shelf. But a TFO world's coming up, they'll not hear about it, and then they'll say, oh, there was something way long back. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll be like uh, just, just buried in the, the history books, you know? Yeah, like if you ask the youngsters now, is, what is a cassette? What is a tape recorder? They go, huh, what? You mean an MP3 player? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. Tisk tisk. Moving on with the times there, but I guess we, we should move on for Brickshelf then. So, uh, like I mentioned in your your introduction, you are a member of several lugs, and Sea Lug I think is the one that people are probably most familiar with. That's the Seattle lug, yeah. obviously. But uh, you're a member of a couple others: the PS LTC and Arch Lugs. You want to tell people Sound what Lego those Club? are? Yeah, Puget Sound Lego Puget Trains Sound. Club. Uh, I'm not so much of a train head as I am the town section. So, uh, and they're really cool builders in that club, and so I love hanging out with them, and they're uh, really nice people. And I build for the town section. They build the trains, I build the town section. So yeah, you need to, Everybody needs to do something, right? So a train builder that doesn't build town buildings, you, you yeah. pick up the yeah. slack where they leave it off. Yeah. So. Now, wasn't, and, uh, wasn't the Puget Sound Lego Train Club interviewed in uh, Jess Gibson's uh, blockumentary? That came out a couple years ago. Do you remember watching that? I don't remember watching that. Strangely, it was like they, they interviewed a couple members or a couple people at like BrickCon, and I think I remember them talking to somebody uh, in the Puget Sound Club about like a, a display they're doing at like a, a local like toy train fair. Yeah, uh, possibly. We we are doing another display this weekend at a train uh, fair. In Puyallup, so uh, but I don't remember this interview. No. Yeah, but um, it must be nice, kind of displaying outside of normal like Lego fan events, like BrickCon and different other Lego-oriented uh, events, to kind of get out in like a general like hobbyist like uh, public. You know, is that is. nice? Yeah, it's really fun. You see all these. These are train builders basically, and they have all these different uh, the H scale and the O scale, and they have their displays, and they have their set little you know houses and cottages, and they build that layout there. Yeah. And I think ours is more fun because we build just about everything. We build our yeah. own trees and our own cottages and houses and cities and. Uh, yeah, they go to the store and buy like a, a pre-made train station, right? And they just yeah, kind of mix yeah. Them together. Yeah. Yeah, just plop it there and they're <laughs> just train people, but we are like all around us, so Yep. And I'm sure the kids probably like the Lego display a little bit more than like the, the styrofoam mountains and Yeah. Uh, the, I think the Lego display is the biggest uh, crowd pleaser over there. Oh, definitely. I've I've heard that from different people that have displayed at those kind of train events, you know, they always say like, yeah, well, our display was kind of the only thing that people really seemed to want to look at. That was kind of weird, but so, but that's awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then how about Sea Lug? What what is it like being in such? That's a, a very large, uh, diverse group of builders, right? That is a very large. When I started off in Sea Lug, that was in two thousand four. Uh, we were a much smaller group of people. We were like twelve to fifteen of us in uh, meetings. And we had meetings in people's houses where the sofa, uh, the couch, the living room chairs was enough. Yep. And uh, everybody knew everybody. And it was like more than a Lego friendship. Real friendships developed and stuff like that. Now, of course, I think they say there's about 200 on the mailing list or more. Uh, we have 40 or 50 people for each meeting. Wow. And we fill up library awesome. spaces. and. It is awesome in a certain way, and then you go, yeah, I know this name online, but who's this person in this room? (laughs) 
Yeah. I guess that yeah. is true. You gotta if you get too big, eventually, other you can lose some of that close friendships and stuff like you were saying when they first started out. Yeah, yeah. That's why I hang out more with the PSL TC people, or I like to. Uh, not there's nothing wrong with the CLOC people, but uh, it's just a nice small little group, and you just talk Lego, and it's fun. Definitely. Yeah, there's it's nice having a big group sometimes, but there there are some downsides. Yeah. Get that big, yeah. like, you know, kind of informal feeling to interactions. Yeah. The meetings are kind of formal now. Everybody introduces themselves. They talk a little bit. But the older meetings, it was like everybody knew everybody. Hey, hi, great to see you, and stuff like that. Yeah. So does it start to feel like town council meetings, kind of like, you know? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I've been... I have an issue. Excuse me. Actually, there was one meeting where everybody was like raising their hand, and I I freaked out. I was like, "What's happening to Felix?" Oh my gosh! Yeah. <laughs> tisk tisk. Hmm. Yeah. So how about Archlug then? Is that uh, what's what's the size like there? Archlug is a small group. We just started a year back, a little over a year back. Uh, my friend Jeffrey Palentier, he. He's kind of in his second uh, lull of uh, building, but he was a great town builder, and I met him at BrickCon. And the two of us kept talking. It's like, let's have a group, which is, since Zilog was growing so big, is let's have a group that is just town and architecture-based, kind of. And uh, we kept talking, and we never did anything about it, really. We said, yeah, we'll meet, we'll do something. And then there was in one of the C log meetings, Alice Finch, the Hogwarts lady. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She stood up and she said, "Let's start another group, uh, castle based and architecture kind of based." And we said, "There you go, she's doing it." And <laughs> just kind of tagged along. And uh, yeah, we all few of us we had our first meeting uh, at my place, so it was a small meeting uh, in February. Uh, this year, and we concentrate on uh, architecture stuff, uh, castle stuff, and town stuff, basically. Mm -hmm. Most of us are people from CLUG. It's just a smaller group where we concentrate and just talk about uh, architecture stuff. Yes. Yeah, so, so is there are there some budding builders there with the within the architecture category? Uh, of course, there's Alice. <laughs> she had the great uh, Rivendell, and there's David Frank who did Rivendell with her. Uh, there's uh, Stephen Walker, there's Thomas Garrison. These are PSLT and CLUG people who've been building since way before I started. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, a really good group of people. Hmm. If I missed some names, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> It's understandable, but yeah, that, that's really cool. And it's nice that you've got all those different groups and lugs out there that you can interact with, and they, they kind of serve their, each serve their own purpose, so that's, that's yeah. really nice. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. Yeah, we go, sometimes it's like too many meetings in a month, too much Lego, and the family kind of complains, but uh, <laughs> there's no such thing like too much Lego, is there? <laughs> no. Nope, I, I don't think so. <laughs> There might be, but I don't think anybody's ever ever gotten to that point. Yeah. Or have yet to meet anybody that's gotten to that point. Sure, it's like when you have like so much Lego that it's just like like all over your floors, every room. Maybe that's too much Lego. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe if you can't walk and you have to kind of each step you take, you have to kind of with your feet push the Lego away. I would say that would be too much Lego. Maybe. But otherwise. Uh, maybe you can just walk over it. Over just, keep it. No building, just keep building. Just keep building. Yeah. yeah. You, you're gonna see a Lego hoarder show pop up soon, and that's when it's gotten a little out of control. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> you have to start carving paths through the through the piles of Lego. <laughs> yeah, I'll have like a shovel. <laughs> so do you ever have to define yourself like balancing like time you could spend building with like time you could spend with your family with time you could spend. Like going to Lego meetings, is that ever like a, a hard balance to strike for you, or? Uh, not really. It hasn't happened. I think just before BrickCon, uh, 
Yeah, September, that's the month where this problem happens. It's like, no, no, I have to finish my mock for BrickCon. Uh, I don't want to drive an hour for this meeting, probably. Uh, something like that. But otherwise, uh, I don't think I've had this problem. Yeah, that's good. I, I've, I've had friends to, to complain about that, like say, oh, well, I'm not going to be at the meeting this weekend because I'd rather just like stay home and build because I don't really have that yeah. much time to spend yeah. on Lego. But, yeah, I can understand that if that arises. But it's good that you guys, or you keep it kind of down pat most of the year. I can imagine the leading up to a big convention like BrickCon, that would be kind of a, a rush period, right? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of, and yeah. you're doing mocks this size, uh, it's crazy, so. Oh, uh, yeah. It's a whole other, like, ball game, right? Yeah, that was, this was the biggest I've done, and so that was, like, maybe yeah. I'll build, like, micro-size next year or something. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that you uh, kind of, I think your first BrickCon was in 2004, or at least you, you started in C-Lug then, and so what kind of uh, led up to, to finding C-Lug like that? What was some of your history within the LEGO community? Uh, I found I accidentally found BrickCon online in I think a little uh, in early 2004, and so I decided, oh, this is I mean just the idea that this is a, it's an exhibition, a convention of just Lego that was just amazing, and so I went to it, and of course, like uh, people have their first experiences with Con, it's like your jaw drops and you go, oh wow, people <laughs> know this. That was what I felt. Uh, so that was my first uh, kind of, oh, there's a group of adults that build with Lego and they build serious stuff. First thing, I'm not crazy. So <laughs> that was my first reaction. It's like, I'm not crazy. There's a whole group here. And then uh, they told me about C-Lug at that time. And then I went to my first C-Lug meeting. That was pretty cool. A really nice group of people, very welcoming, um, especially since, one, I'm a woman, and second, I'm a foreigner. Uh, they, they were a really nice group of people, encouraging. Uh, it, it felt like, oh, if I'm looking for a planet of people, I found it. <laughs> These are my people. These are my tribe. I belong. So uh, that was nice, and then uh, I just kept building from then on, and uh, the first little mock I took there to this meeting. Like when you go for your first ever LEGO meeting, you say, what do you, what do, you do, what, what is expected of you? And so they said, just, just build something, bring a small mock or something. And so uh, I had this little house. It was built like in a South Indian kind of uh, architectural style. It's like a courtyard house with uh, everything around it. It's kind of Spanish, if you would like to say. And uh, it had a little swing set in front of it. And it had one simple tree with white flowers on it. And I took this to the meeting. And everybody was like so... Uh, kind of encouraging with this mark, and I thought, well, these are the same people who I saw at BrickCon build all those, building all those awesome things, and so why is this little thing nice or whatever? <laughs> and so they kind of explained to me that this tree had never, this technique for this tree had not been done before, and they said, no, you must post pictures, and this is brick shelf, and this is how you do it, and then there's lug net. And then you go post on Lagnet, and it was uh, just went on from there, and part of C-Lug and part of building community, and it was just like that. Mm -hmm. It's a very beautiful tree, and I, I remember seeing that for the first time somewhere, and I, I remember thinking like that is a very, very great technique for a tree, and I think it might have been your brick shelf, honestly, a while oh. back. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this photo is actually, the photo you're looking at here is actually on Brick Shelf. So here's a good example of finding some, some cool stuff on Brick Shelf here. <laughs> that is why Brick Shelf is awesome, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Now, you meant, mentioned that you, you were kind of a foreigner when you first joined, and so uh, you actually grew up in India, is that right? I did. I, I grew up in India, and I moved here when I was like... 
31 years old. I visited here before, but I'm so in India, uh, there was no Lego when I grew up. Uh, there weren't foreign toys and Lego being foreign from Europe. Uh, <laughs> somebody gave me just one set as a gift. And this was when I was eight or nine years old or something. And it was one of these, you know, town system sets. Uh, it was a house. And the instructions had three different ways of building the house. And so I finished building all those. And I said, well, I love this thing. And it seems like I like to build. So I broke those down and came up with my own ideas. And then I found myself sketching different kinds of houses or just, you know, trying to build different from the same single set, uh, just build different things. And that probably was like the first setting or the groundwork for the idea to, these are your pieces, this is limited, there's no more here. And so just, if you want to build, you just have to come up with different ideas with the same pieces. So you think yeah. like having that limitation of pieces kind of like helped spur on your creativity? Cause you Definitely. Kinda, I think that... Like, oh, let me get some more parts. You're like, oh, let me just use what I have. Yeah, there's no, there's no let me get more parts. There are no more parts. <laughs> there's no such possibility. <laughs> so if I want to build, and I just... So I just remember so many times I would just take the box, turn it upside down, and start building something different. Yeah, and I think that's that's actually a really great point, like, to keep in mind, like, even if you're still building today, like, I know I try to, like, avoid, like, placing a lot of bricklink orders. I try and, like, limit what I build to kind of what I have because it sort of forces me to get creative. Yeah. Because if it was just like, oh, let me go out and get, you know, a part that's perfect for what I need, why not just rummage through the bins you have and find something that works? So you got to keep that creativity alive, right? Yeah, and I mean that's. I think that's one of the biggest uh, plus points of Lego is when you, when I look at a part, it's something like, okay, uh, let's try to use this is studs up. Okay, let's put it on its side. Now, what does it look like? Or oh, let's and I mean it's not building. Uh, it's just something fantastic and just challenging myself to use a part not in the way it's supposed to be used but in something else, side, upside down, whatever. Uh, I think that's that's the way to go. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and going back to your point about the small mm -hmm. collection, I, I think that a lot of people's first instinct is when they start building, well, to build something good, I obviously am going to need like a big collection or something to go out and get all these parts. Yeah. But in reality, if you if you look at it from a creative viewpoint, uh, you, you, can, you can do some stuff with not very many parts. You definitely can, and there's some great builds. Yes, just small little things. Uh, you always come across, almost every day I see something on Flickr, which is fantastic, and you don't need 10,000 parts for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like then coming, when you, when you came to the U.S. and uh, saw you know, all, all the toy stores and uh, all the Lego you could get here? I'd imagine that was pretty amazing for you. <laughs> That was. I mean, it was like the first, my first uh, experience with that was I was walking downtown and there was this old toy store. It's FAO Schwartz. It's, they've shut down now. Something like Toys R Us. Uh, Toys R Us. Uh, I was walking down and I saw these display windows and it was just full of bricks, uh, these brick tubs. The red tub, the yellow tub, not the yellow. There was a blue tub and the red tub. And I, I looked at that and went, oh my god, Lego, I love Lego. And so I just ran inside, I grabbed a couple of boxes and there was all <laughs> the sets over there and it was just amazing. So to me it was like, oh, I found something that I didn't even know I was missing. I had forgotten <laughs> about, I mean, I'd stopped building years back, so I had completely forgotten. And then since it's like this is a new country, I'm just kind of getting my bearings here and uh, I find one thing that I'm familiar with and I love and so it was it was a really nice experience. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's nice that, uh, yeah, like you said, coming to a new country, I mean imagine for a lot of people that's a hard experience so if you can come and find something that you really enjoy like that, that helps a lot. 
Yeah, and I when I mean I didn't know many Indians here, and uh, I didn't have much contact with the Indian community. My family, I'm like I said, I'm married to a white Caucasian guy, so his family is white, and his friends are white, and I'm like, okay, this whole culture and the way they talk, and everything is really <laughs> the food is the food has only salt and pepper. Oh my god. <laughs> It's not hot. So, There's no, it's no flavor. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I and so I find Lego. And it's everything like, kind of like sort of ices over all the cracks, right? Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> was that the FAO Schwartz in New York, the the big one? The no, there was one downtown Seattle. Really? That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Very nice. So uh, now I think we we definitely want to. Uh, look, take a look at some of your builds. You've uh, obviously become a, a great builder now after <laughs> some all of that interesting history over coming over here, finding finding all the awesome Lego uh, builds that you could do, and started in on your own uh, really much bigger builds. Now that you had a bigger collection, and the first one I think that we'll talk about was uh, the one that you actually have behind you there. Obviously, this massive. This is your your Tiger's Nest Monastery. Just a Incredible, incredible build here. Uh, it's it's hard to even wrap your mind around this. Uh, if so you just want to tell us a little bit about it and how big exactly is this? Uh, the front is about somewhere around seven feet. Uh, the depth is about four feet, and height I'd say is approximately three and a half, four feet. Not really sure, but it's massive. Yeah, I can't I can't put it. It's like in bits and pieces all over the house. Most of it is in just boxes. So, <laughs> so does it break down for transport? Or yeah, it's it's all modular. So That's this awesome. is one piece. This is also in three different pieces. So. Yeah, that's great to like think about transportation when you're like building it. Because I know a lot of people they build these big things and then they can't get them out of the room they make them in. Because yeah, you never thought about you know, hey, maybe I want to like break it down and take it to BrickCon. Or... Well, that came from experience taking stuff, building stuff for BrickCon and taking it there. I've learned over the years you have to build it strong. You have to pack it. It has to fix in the box, the cardboard box sizes. It has. That box has to fix in, uh, fit in the car. You do that too. You measure the cardboard box, make sure. Yeah, I I, I find myself doing that sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. I didn't do it for this because I was uh, kind of uh, more focused on the creativity of it. But yeah. eventually, when I started packing, I said, "Oh, if I have to take it to another convention, I have to make changes here because." Yeah. Hmm. And. <clears throat> So what was your some of your inspiration uh, for this build then? Has this always been an, an interest area for you? I know you build a lot of architecture. Yeah, so architecture just just fascinates me from you know different parts of the world. And I keep going through uh, pictures just on the internet and magazines and stuff of interesting buildings. And I came across this last year sometime in December. And uh, I had seen pictures of it before also, but when I saw it this time, I was like, this would be really cool to build. It would be very challenging because the whole thing is, and technically it would be challenging to actually keep it on a table, but the whole thing is on this mountain and get that whole effect. So I said, let me try. So it, the first thought was just let me try from the smallest building. So I. I started, and for this build, there were only two two different kinds of pictures available all over the internet. If you look, there's two angles: one, the one that is shot right now that you showed, and there's another an angle which is like straight on. If you're just standing like three three thousand feet below it, and you just look up. Mm -hmm. And so I studied these two pictures for quite some time, and I said, let me start with the smallest building. And so, and every time I build buildings, it's like I start with the windows, I get the scale of the windows, and then go on from there to get the scale of the building. So I did one building, and then I did the next one, and then I did the third one, and I said, okay, this seems to be moving forward. So I finished the buildings, and then came the difficult part, is okay, make this all stand as if it's on, on a steep mountain. 
And so then the easiest way to do it was keep the buildings on slit on slits. What is the word I'm looking for? Cliffs. Yeah. And then just make the mountain as a, a facade. So all all the rock work is a basic facade. It's it moves out and it goes back and goes against the buildings. And I started doing it that way and it worked. So and the backdrop uh, is just basically a lot of it is on cardboard boxes. It's just propped up. <laughs> so that, that's kind of the way you got the, the back to get up there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, building that much would have taken me a lot of bricks, a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's the secret. I've, I've given you the secret now. <laughs> So you've given it away for, for anyone else who wants to build a massive build like this. That's one way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen people take like Duplo bricks, you know, like the big ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they just build like a big, big base with the uh, the Duplo bricks. There is a lot of Duplo in here. Oh, that's fantastic. Also, there yeah. you go. But a little cardboard is always good too. That's yeah. A cardboard gotta, like, box get all this that, size. All that height, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think you, you did capture this perfectly. I was looking up uh, before the show. I wasn't real familiar with this in, in real life, so I looked at some some photos of it. And just uh, everything, the, the roof, the, the buildings, the cliffs, I think you, you did a great job capturing for how hard how hard the building was, like you were saying. I mean, obviously, all the, all the little details you got in there, I think, capture this building perfectly. And yeah, just that looking at the photos in real life, it's an incredible building. Look at the way they built that into the, the cliff there. Yeah. Josh, do you think you could pull up a photo of the real one? I think I could, yeah, if, if people aren't familiar with it. So uh, while I'm doing that, Anu, you want, were there any like interesting uh, parts uses it, usages or anything like that that you came up on while, while you were building it? Definitely, definitely. Uh, the, the biggest challenge was actually getting the windows. In the real building, the windows are like intricately carved wooden windows. And each building has been made in a different period of time. And so each window is different. Uh, that's, I noticed that after I'd gone a few buildings into it, kind of. Uh, but I said, OK, I got this down. And then I got this building down. And so I look at the next one. I say, oh my god, these windows are completely different. And so to get that effect with our limited Lego parts. I mean, it, yeah, we have a lot of Lego parts, but with the parts you have, trying to get that done was a huge challenge. And there were, like, maybe sometimes for a particular design of the window, I may have taken over two or three weeks. Sometimes I just notice I'm just staring at it, and it's been an hour. <laughs> just trying to stare at the window and see what exactly is happening here, and then doing something, you know, with the Lego pieces, okay, this doesn't work. Okay, what are, what other pieces do we have? Sometimes I would just notice I'm going through BrickLink. It's like, what are the pieces available? What can I take to build this? What can I use to build this? And, of course, there's this thing. It's like, don't go to BrickLink all the time and just buy the parts. What do you have? What do I have in stock? Can I use this in this particular way and get this uh, mm -hmm. look? So... Yeah, that was uh, that was very exciting for me, and I love doing that. I love using parts in different ways. Uh, so that was, I enjoyed doing that, but it was pretty stressful also. It's like I need it to look exactly like this. If if it were an imaginary building, it's really easy. I mean, you just do something and it looks good, and you say, "Yeah, I'm ready to go." But this has to look like this, so. Yeah, and when it's a real life building, it's all that like thoughtfulness of uh, recreating it. You know, thinking so hard about all the details that it kind of comes out in the the model you create because it looks like something that like somebody cared about, not just like a dry recreation, like a, another generic. Uh, yeah. Um, it just looks like something that somebody kind of made with their own hands, just like the yeah. real thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I pulled up a photo of the real thing here for people who aren't familiar with it, so you can see what it looks like here. And yeah, I mean, if if you would compare this photo side by side with uh, Anu's build, it's very very similar. So uh, it's remarkable how you could get all those 
all the little details right, like you were saying, messing with the windows and everything for hours. I'm sure that that does take a long time. The resemblance is eerie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that rock, if you can, you notice there's a rock jutting out behind. Yeah, like right up, right up yeah. to the back of it. Yeah. So first, it was like, oh, there's a rock here. First, I figured that out. Then it's like go through the internet. Is can I can I actually see how this rock is attached to the mountainside, or how is it interacting with a building, or is what what exactly? So I spent a lot of time doing that. Then finally, I saw the front picture, and you can see the rock. There's a tree growing right in front of the rock, which is really annoying to me. It's like I can't get this. I can't see this properly. Uh, but I figured that out, and then to build that rock in Lego and attach it to the building, that huge structure like this, uh, I think that was one of the most difficult parts of building this whole mock. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. That, I know that that rock building can be very hard, but like I said, tur turned out great. So that's really cool. So uh, what was some of the um, reaction to this at BrickCon? I believe you displayed it there, right? Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, it was the first time I displayed this mark, and it was pretty amazing. Uh, I haven't, I haven't interacted with the public uh, in this way, and everybody was like really amazed by this, and it kind of, it kind of had an humbling effect on me. <laughs> more than, I mean, of course, there was like, yay, I've done a great job here, but it was more like, oh my god. This this people's reaction it it kind of brought tears to my eyes at some point. So and of course uh, the attendees the builders the AFOLs it was it was funny there were these uh, space guys two or three of them and I would watch them come and look at this build and go back and then over the over the four days they would come back and each of them separately or sometimes together and then I think one of the last days. Uh, one of the guys was there, and another one, when none of his friend came, and he said, dude, you're here. He says, yeah, and I'm a space guy. <laughs> so, so you got the spacers out of the, their, little, their little bubble, and you yeah. brought them over to your world. Yeah, yeah. They left the spacecrafts and came to town or architecture <laughs> area. <laughs> so you know you're doing something right when that happens. I guess so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is there a lot of architecture at uh, BrickCon? What's that like there, a fair amount of architecture builders? Uh, uh, I started, I think we started this team, uh, let's see, three or four years back. And we had, uh, the first year I was there, and I think there were two more builders. That's it. <laughs> and we had small mocks. And uh, this year we had quite a few, seven or eight builders, large mocks. Uh, Stephen Walker did his whole Disneyland. It, that was huge, eight by eight, eight feet by eight feet spread. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a few other builders as well. So it's it's a biggish area now. Not not as big as space or castle or something like that, but it's getting popular. We're getting up there. Yeah, yeah, that's really impressive, and I know that that architecture stuff is really cool. I I always like seeing that at the the conventions. So. Def definitely keep doing that, and I hope that grows more in the future and future years as well. I hope so, too, yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. And uh, another build that I wanted to um, make sure that we talked about, just because this really caught my eye going over, going through your builds, and I think you might still have some of this build as well. Uh, this is your Rialto uh, Bridge, I believe, in Venice. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a recreation of the Rialto Bridge in Venice. I did this last year. Uh, again, I did it for BrickCon, and I displayed it there for the first time. And this was a very interesting build as well. It was difficult to get the bridge, but get the bridge exact. Uh, but it was—it's not just a normal bridge, right? Does it have? Is it vendor stalls that are on the bridge? Yeah, yeah. There's vendor stalls uh, between. If you have one of those shots, like between the two bridges. Uh, there's a lot of stalls yeah. selling stuff. And so, uh, but the buildings around it and the whole scene, that was really fun to do. 
uh, all the Venetian architecture and the old buildings around it, and uh, it was a fun build to do. Yeah, because it's really, it's not a, a model of the Rialto Bridge. It's like a model of the Rialto Bridge in the context of its surroundings, like all the buildings around it, all the, the water, everything. Well, so, it's just, it's just, it's kind of bland to do just a bridge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not like a, an abstract, like, like sculpture of the bridge. It's just like, you know, it's like everything that goes with the bridge, which makes yeah. it like, all the more interesting. Kind of like whole, the, the monastery. Yeah. All the, the context, the mountains, the... Any any mock, I would say, even the smallest little mock, you add a little greenery to it, or you add some minifigs to it, depending yeah. on the context of the whole thing. Uh, it just changes the whole feel of the mock, I I think. Exactly. Yeah, it makes it into something that's like kind of a little personal, kind of easily to relate to, instead of just like a like a Lego architecture, kind of how they just do the building and there's nothing else there. Yeah. Uh, th that's kind of boring. So yeah. yeah, but you put you put a little life into it. You put a few mini figs. You, I mean, you just make it like uh, if it's just a mock, it's kind of still. It's just a sculpture of something. But you put life into it once you start adding a little bit of surrounding or real life feel to it or something. Definitely, yeah. And you can like I can see myself walking along the little street right there. You know, it's like all cool. the little figures going <laughs> about their daily fine. business. Yeah. Have a glass of wine, sit around, yeah. watch the people. Take in the tourists. Probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I, have you visited this in real life? I have. I have. That was years back. I think that was even before I started uh, Lego building again. So, uh, but I dug through all my pictures and um, I found some, and I could use them. <laughs> Very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this was another very impressive build. So, were there any uh, piece usages or anything like that that stood out in this one? Was there anything, especially it looks like the bridge there, some of the arches and detailing and stuff like that you had on the bridge? Was there anything that surprised you as you were building it? Uh, while building the bridge, I think I was pretty much focused on getting uh, the feel of the bridge. So, using the parts in such a way that. Um, it's like it looks exactly like the bridge. Like if you see a real picture and you see this, uh, you shouldn't say like, okay, this is just made of Lego. It doesn't look like it, kind of. Mm -hmm. Though it is made of Lego and it looks <laughs> made of Lego. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I was pretty much focused for the bridge part itself. But for the buildings, I used quite a bit of parts. Um, I turned them upside down. I got this whole uh, effect of, you know, adding texture to the buildings because those buildings they have a lot of facade work and they have a lot of interesting work done on them. Uh, for that, I used quite a bit of parts, inverted things upside down. I have a building here. I can show you. Oh sure, yeah. If you if you still have something built, definitely. Yeah. Well, yeah, perfect. So, uh, yeah, these buildings here, the orange and white one here, uh, I put arches upside down and kind of gave that whole look. And that that was very interesting for me to do. Is that that new uh, nougat color that came out in yeah. Princess Persia? Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, it looks like a lot. It kind of adds like a real, like it pops with that white you know, around it. It's very nice. And I used a lot of technique pieces for that last building, the gray building over there. Can you see it? Yes, yeah, yeah. So... I can see it there. And I wanted to build balconies, so I just had these kind of pieces and turned them upside down. Mm -hmm. um, that was really fun to do. Very cool. <laughs> And did you look at photos of the actual buildings that surround the bridge? I, uh, yeah, as many as I got. Uh, because when people go visiting this place, they mostly take pictures of the bridge, not the buildings around it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you kind of look at the background and say, oh, well, there, there it is, there's something. Yeah. So uh, I did, uh, if you ju just do a general search, like Venetian kind of buildings, 
So these buildings aren't really exactly the ones that are around the bridge. Yeah, I don't, it's like, I it's like an approximation. Just yeah. Like, yeah. And this is the part when I said, I'm going to have fun. I'm just going to build interesting stuff. Yeah. So I had already done the part where everything has to look like the bridge. And so the that's how. You're just going to fill it in with your imagination. Yeah. yeah. And right. that's the fun part of it. So, yeah. Definitely. A little creative license never hurt to, to make a build of that, that much cooler. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I did honestly look at pictures as like Venetian buildings, and this is how they look like, so I, I'll go from here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Works out nicely in the end. Yeah. So do you have any other projects planned for the future? Any, any more uh, cool architecture things you can tell us about? Uh, I haven't really planned for what I'm going to do next, but I had this idea that uh, a very interesting thing to build would be the whole of Westeros. Uh, are you familiar with Game of Thrones at all? A little it's bit. Somewhat, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So it, it's a book, uh, a five series book, or five books into one, and it's about, it's this historical fantasy kind of uh, setting, kings and stuff, um, wars and towns and old cities that have been destroyed and dragons and uh, but the way they describe this whole country or the world as it exists the West, there's Westeros, there's the sea and there's the old islands or the free cities and they describe um, all these cities in a very interesting way so there's scope for uh, towns, there's scope for a castle, there's scope for a lot of forest and landscaping. Uh, there's really elaborate cities, and some of them have gone to decay. So that gives another level of uh, art over there, if you want to call it, because mm -hmm. you make this grand kind of city, but it's dilapidated. So you have all that scope to work with. Uh, I have this idea. Let's see. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> it's a huge, huge undertaking. I guess, what, wait for a couple brick cons from now, maybe? To, to see the, the finished piece, yeah? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's kind of, you know, cooking in my brain, kind of. It's like, I keep thinking. I'm reading the books right now, and I'm almost finished. I'm done. I'm book five. And so every night when I pick it up, I go, okay, so they're describing this, so translate into Lego. <laughs> That's awesome. So hopefully something will come of it, right? Hopefully. <laughs> we'll see. Definitely something to look forward to in the future there then. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in bits and pieces, yeah. I'll try one part out and then the next and let's see how it works. Mm -hmm. So is there anything uh, then that on a uh, slightly uh, unrelated topic to Legos, is, are there any hobbies or other interests that you have that may maybe people who follow your, your Lego building would be surprised about or something interesting that you'd want to tell people? Uh, surprised about? No. I think it's all, I love architecture, so that's there. I love reading. So I could spend hours just reading. In fact, there are days when I wake up and decide, Today's a holiday. It's not Saturday. It's not Sunday. But I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I do that. I love solving jigsaw puzzles. I can do that for hours. I you know pick up a thousand, two thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and I attack it and I'm stuck to that till it's done. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy doing that as well. It can provide like the same kind of like high that Lego does, right? Like solving a problem, sort of physically, you know. I yeah, I guess so. I guess that's related somehow. Everything ties back to Lego, right, Josh? Yeah. <laughs> Has to. <laughs> yeah, I find for all my hobbies at least, everything kind of goes back to Lego, right? It's yeah. it's the yeah. You look at the world, and I find myself is like you're just walking around. Oh, this would be cool to build in Lego. <laughs> <laughs> like just translate everything into Lego. Oh yeah, yeah. You start looking at things and thinking, you know, like how do I build that in Lego? Uh, like thinking about Lego like dimensions. I look at like spacing of windows differently now. Yeah. Yeah. You betcha. 
just just all, always thinking about the next project then. So wh whatever whatever you can make that looks cool. That's always yeah. nice. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned a few times that uh, you you've gone you display a lot of BrickCon, uh, obviously. So are there any other conventions people can find you at? And do you think you'll definitely be able to make it to BrickCon next year? Definitely. BrickCon, uh, there's no question. I'm going to be there. <laughs> uh, uh, I might travel to Portland. I might go to Brick's Cascade. I'm thinking uh, if I can do it this year. Uh, there's a plan. Definitely. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure everybody would lo love to see your builds there, so that would be very neat. Uh, the actually, what made me think of it was the response I got at BrickCon for Tiger's Nest, and I thought, oh, people, people like it. So uh, <laughs> um, I thought if I can, this was, went in 18 boxes and two cars, and so if I can get it down to like one big truck or something. <laughs> Uh, that that's my problem. It's like if I can pack it in such a way that both of us can go drive down in one car, uh, I definitely go to Briggs Cascade. Mm. I'd like to show it off. Definitely. Yeah, maybe, maybe you have to rent like a moving truck or something like that to get it down yeah. there, <laughs> like a U-Haul or something. <laughs> something like that. But yeah, it, it should all fix fit in one kind of. Yeah, it might fit in the U-Haul. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> rent one of those. Well, actually, don't rent one of those trailers. Like the, because I heard they have like no suspension. So don't get a trailer if you're don't don't. Mm -mm, Got to get a good suspension. Yeah, I heard Ooh, you I say that. Like yeah, one of your shows. I heard you tell one of your guests that it's like don't get one of those trailers. They have no suspensions, mm -hmm. and you have just a bunch of pieces when you reach there. I was talking to one of my uh, a lug friends once, and we were decide like thinking about what the best car for transporting Lego would be, and we said a hearse would be perfect for Lego. Because think of a hearse that it has like a really good suspension. There's a big flat bed in the back. I mean, it'd be a little macabre, but a little weird driving a hearse around full of Lego. But as far as like you know, you want to make sure your creations don't fall apart. Then you might be onto something with that. Well, the important part is yeah, get there without your creations. Falling apart. Never mind what the transport is. <laughs> exactly. So, if there are any used hearses, like on Craigslist or something, you know, go uh, pick up one of those. Yeah, I might do that. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Always, always, you know, willing to give a suggestion or two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you never know. <laughs> just, just laying out some, some wisdom for you there. So, <laughs> next, uh, if if you see her driving around in a hearse, uh, you'll you'll know where she got the idea. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, may maybe somewhat related to uh, someone driving around in a hearse. Are there any uh, interesting or funny stories from the the years you've been attending BrickCon and going to these different Lego events? Uh, seen anything interesting like that? Uh, let me think. I think one of the really funny experience for me personally was my first BrickCon as an attendee. Uh, that was, I think, back in 2005. Uh, it was a small con. There must have been like 50 or 50-something 50 attendees. And so I went up. I went into the building. And there were two women there. And um, one of, I knew one of them from c -Lug. Um No, actually, yeah, I, I knew one of them from c -Lug. And so I, I go up there and... Uh, I check in, and she checks me in and everything, and I say, okay, so now what? And she says, they're just setting up in the other room. Uh, you want to go see? Do you need to set up? I said, I have this yay little mark. It was like a 32 base plate mark, and that was all I had for the first one, first brick on. Uh, so I said, okay, I'll go. And she said, well, if you don't need to set up right now, they're setting up tables. You want to help them? I said, sure, why not? So I go into this room. There, it's full of guys setting up tables. And there must have been like 20, 30 guys just setting up tables and stuff like that. And so I look around. There's no woman there. Um, and so the, everybody's talking. So I need to raise my voice just a little bit to get their attention. <laughs> so I just say, hi, 
does anybody need any help? Uh, I have nothing to do and I can help with anything. And at that moment, there's this whole room of guys, 20, 30 of them. They all kind of turn their head towards me. Everyone's just looking for a second or two and they go, no. <laughs> That's it. And it was like so funny because I, I found it really funny. It's like the guys go, oh, there's a girl here. <laughs> Wait a minute. I can't fart. I can't. There you go. Yeah, I have to be a normal person. Yeah. Yeah. I think having girls at like Lego conventions kind of raises the level of discourse a little bit, you know? Makes things a little more normal, a little less weird. At so. that time. Now, of course, there's many women. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But Definitely. back there, that time, there was just three of us. And yep. two, two of them were wives of uh, congoers, like Thomas Rayford and Wayne Hussey. So Terry Landers was there, and Chris was there. Uh, that's it, and that was me. And so it, it was a little funny. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> so, uh, uh, going against the norm, then, since it's, it's usually the uh, the guys that build, have you convinced your your husband to be a Lego builder yet, or has he been for a while? He hasn't been a Lego builder. No, he 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 does two things. He supports me when I say I'm building. Do not disturb. <laughs> There's no dinner, and he goes, "Okay, we'll work with that." <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing. He never looks at the credit card bill and says, what the heck are you doing here? <laughs> He's never <laughs> once said that to me. So that support is, is, is a lot for me. That's good. That's no, he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't build. But when I'm building, I can, I can like l ask him for his uh, opinion. He doesn't look, of course, he looks at it from an outsider, from the public, not an AFOL. He doesn't realize the small little details and the technique, but he sees what a normal person would see, and he gives me that feedback. And so that, that's pretty helpful. That's awesome. That's about as much as you could ever ask for, right? Yeah, and then he doesn't build, so I have all the pieces to myself. I don't need to share them with anybody. It's better, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You your pieces. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't ask me how much I'm buying, and don't touch my pieces. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you keep them all to yourself, yeah, things work out fine. <laughs> yeah, no, but he's a real, he's a good support, and if he weren't there, I mean, if his support was not uh, as much as it is, I couldn't probably build something like this. <laughs> that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's that's really nice. Yeah. <clears throat> So I think we'll uh, finish out the interview here then with, uh, you talked a little bit about earlier uh, kind of coming and building your own, uh, seeing all the, all the sets here in the U.S. and all the, all the different pieces you could buy. So you want to tell us a little bit about uh, some of the specifics of how you built your collection over the year? Any, any tips you'd have for people who are looking to build their collection now? Uh, I personally, uh, I buy a lot of pick-a-brick. Um, and then if I need specific pieces, I go to uh, Bricklink, Cracklink, as Matthew calls it. <laughs> Cracklink it is, yep. Uh, but, yeah, I, I basically go to the Lego store, and I ask them, what do you have? They say, what do you need? I say, no, 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 what do you have? Because I look at the pieces, and I think pieces themselves inspire. Lego itself inspires you. Like, you see a piece and you think, oh, what can I do with this? I can probably build this or that. Or recently, like, I went to the store and they had the round 2 by 2 uh, white brick with the grill on it. Oh, yes, yeah. So I bought a bunch of that and I said, okay, I'm not going to put this one on top of the other. I'm going to turn it on its side. And so these grilled Here's things that, are... Right? Yeah. And then just put it one, take a plate or something and just put it on its side and see what you can do with it. So I'd say that's how I basically buy my pieces. I go look at what they have and say, okay, this will be interesting to use in this way or that way. And uh, When I go to the Lego store and I buy a pick-a-brick cup and they ask me what I'm going to do with the parts, 
I always tell them I'm just going to go home and like throw the stuff on the table and let the pieces talk to me. Exactly. Tell them, exactly. Tell them what yeah. they want me to do with yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you yeah. go. That's what there you, you go. have to do. Yeah. Uh, I do buy sets. I buy the bigger cafe corner type sets. And oh, those are great parts packs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, basically, I buy the sets for pieces, not. Sets themselves. I do build them. I mean, some of them have really cool building techniques and whatever. But, uh, so, what do you uh, think of the new uh, Parisian restaurant? Then, are you a fan of that? I think it's pretty cool. I like. Hey, did you uh, see it at BrickCon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it at okay. BrickCon. I met Jamie Bernard, really nice guy. Um, nice. And I think it has really cool. The interior is nice. It has some nice. Uh, They've used some arches in a very interesting way to make uh, window frames and stuff. And uh, I think it will be pretty interesting to see. Finally, I'll decide whether I buy it or not, depending on what the parts are. Once BrickLink says what the parts are, or it's published somewhere. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, I have. I do have most of the cafe corner type buildings. But I build it. And it stays for a few days, and then I just break it. I need the parts. So. I did that with Cafe Corner. I remember I built Cafe Corner, and I was like, "It's a great build," and then tore it down and used the parts. And now yeah. I look on BrickLink and I see how much Cafe Corner sells for, and I shed a little tear every time. <laughs> exactly. It, so. Yeah. Well, you can put it all back together. Go through your parts. Yeah, I can go through my collection, just figure yeah. out, and put it back, and then bag it up. Sell it yeah. for a thousand bucks to the highest bidder. Yeah, even the used ones, the price is really enormous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's insane what some of those go for. But even used, some some of those, especially yeah, like cafe corner buildings. Goodness yeah. gracious, yeah. And I I keep wondering why. I mean, it's just out of print, but I'm sure you can buy the parts. I've heard people thinking. say the cafe corner. What makes it special are the um. Like the arch pieces, like the the dark red, uh, okay. roof, like the, and that apparently like they don't appear in quantity in very many sets. So that's like a special piece. But I don't. I, I mean, it's true. You really can put together the rest of the set with kind of parts that are available everywhere. So Go I figure. would think. Yeah, I haven't done that calculation, but I would think so. Definitely. Or. With the thousand odd dollars, you could buy so many more interesting pieces and build. Yeah, you could go to the Lego store and just buy a ton of pick a brick cups. And <laughs> yeah. Do something yeah. a lot cooler than a cafe corner. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there yeah. you go. Go to the Lego store, buy some pick a brick, get a couple of those big buildings. You'll have a, a pretty handsome looking collection after a while, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's um, and all collections they start small. I mean, nobody has millions of dollars to go buy a bunch of stuff, and you don't even know what you really want in the beginning. Yeah. When you start building, it's like slowly you realize what you what you like to build, what you need, what colors you like. And what you use, yeah, like all headlight bricks. I know I always like to keep a good stock of those. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, the the one by one brick with the one stud. Oh yes, yes. I love those. I those are the, yeah, those are fantastic, yeah. yeah. And then the Travis bricks, right? Studs yeah. on five sides. Yeah. Yeah, keep stuff in quantity. Got to keep... So you figure out what you... Because yeah, like, just buying a bunch of stuff, it, like shots in the dark, you know? You just end yeah. up with boxes of stuff you would never, ever touch. But yeah, you kind of build it slowly. Yeah. Keep it going. Yeah. Definitely. For mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> so there's, there's some really good tips there to, to kind of finish out the... The interview here, so definitely keep those in mind next time you go to go to the Lego store or go to buy some new parts. Uh, I think some some really good advice there. <laughs> yeah, and like I just said, let the bricks talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> for sure. So I think that about wraps it up for us, Anu. It's been a real pleasure having you on. I re really enjoyed talking with you and learning some more about your builds there. Thank you for having me. It was fun talking to the two of you. Definitely. Thank you so much for coming on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll make sure, as always, to include links to all the builds we talked about in the description of this video. So if you want to uh, check out her, her mock pages, Flickr, or even Brick Shelf, uh, you can see all of those <laughs> there. And uh, <laughs> check, out, check out all of her other builds and keep up to date with uh, anything she does in the future as well. And if you're interested in keeping up to date with everything we do here at Beyond the Brick, I'd encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube page and get all our videos in your 
YouTube subscription feed so you can don't miss anything in the future, any of our other interviews or any of the other convention videos we release in the future. So thanks for watching, everybody, and we will see you next week.